I wanted to share with you today um, more of something that I would say is in me than just a structured sermon and something that I pray that you can grasp the depth of it because so often we can try and make things eloquent with words, but actually there's more substance to what I wanted to say today than just dressing it with words and points and bullet points and theories. It's very important that we understand that God has given us everything that we need for today. There is no lack of resource on the earth for a believer. There is no lack in any way, shape, or form. There's no lack of anything. Yet, why do we often live in lack? Now, I am not talking about finances. Finances are a part of life on this earth, but I would argue a far smaller part of life on this earth than what we realize Finances don't fix things. In fact, finances in supply can actually add problems more often than not and create bigger divisions and issues and break apart homes and release addictions and drive more of a brokenness than what we could realize. So when I talk about resource, I'm not just talking about finance. I'm not talking about what you would automatically think. I'm talking about everything that you need or everything that you think you're challenged with or everything that you might appear today as a problem in your life. Do you know that the resource exists for that? Why is it that we walk around in lack? Why is it that we walk around challenged with stuff? Can I just say that, that I just feel that when I get to heaven one day, I'm gonna pose something to Jesus as a question and I'm gonna say, why didn't you just stick around? Because what I found to be very interesting is that we know one thing is consistent of Christ. As long as he was around, things got handled. There was never a situation around Jesus that was a problem. He had his disciples, but let's just call a spade a spade. The disciples at the time of Christ's life were just clingers. I mean, come on. It's not even like they offered a solution. Most of the time, they were the problem. Most of the time, they were the example. One thing I love about the Bible is it doesn't document any human being outside of Christ as someone who isn't just like us, right? Whilst Jesus is teaching, the disciples are the ones in the crowd confused. What are you saying? I don't even know. It's not like they were exempt. It's not like they knew. It's not like they were above us. It's not like they had the inside track of revelation. Most of the time, they were the picture. They were the illustration. Jesus is trying to describe foolishness. He doesn't describe people in the crowd. Often he goes straight for the Pharisee or even the silly disciple. You you even know like in a situation where there is need, the disciples didn't even bring an answer. We've got to feed these people, Jesus. Let's call it a day in the sermon. That's not a solution. I'm preaching. Find some food. Fair enough. Here's a boy's lunch. How is that a solution? Right? Do you know what that is? That is, that's actually trying to drive the message home further. You know, that's, that's often how we are with God. We, we, we actually intend to manipulate him with our interesting responses to things. Don't ever say to God, do whatever you want or I'll do it your way if you are not prepared to do it the way you never wanted to do it in the first place. Uh, Because I can assure you that that is the the essence of God's humor sometimes. Let me just show you how far off the mark you are and what you think is needed for a situation. So here, go get food. Here's food, not enough for one person. They don't pray, they don't believe, they don't even have faith. You can even picture them giving it out like, here we go, this will run out. It was all Jesus. Jesus is prayer, Jesus getting God to bless it, Jesus is obedience, and Jesus is supply. You can almost imagine how they would often be going, let's see how he fixes this, let's see how he solves this. But one thing is sure, in the life of Christ, before he steps into the passion, and before he steps actually into our shoes, And before he cuts himself off from his disciples in his journey towards the cross, it's all cool as long as Jesus is around. I mean, they even start to grasp this concept because they're in a boat that they think is sinking and they go and wake him up. But he's in the boat. So they are cool with the fact that as long as he's in the boat, it's okay. We'll be fine. So as long as Jesus is around... There's an answer. There's a solution. 
There's a sermon. There's supply. You're irrelevant. You're dead. It's fine. Jesus is here. It's okay. And this is how we want to live our lives. We want our lives to be with the assurance that Jesus is here. Because if he's here, it's easy. You just bring him the problem, right? And here's the funny thing. If you read your Bible, you'll notice the disciples have zero ministries until Jesus leaves. There's no documentation of the great sermon of the disciple Peter. There's no documentation of the great works of the apostle Paul. There's no documentation of anybody doing anything besides following Jesus and slowing him down to a degree, having doubt, irritating everyone, getting in the way, choosing the wrong person who's going to get healed, not letting the person through that should get healed, bringing the person. Do you get what I'm trying to say? They represented the flesh, just like us. They're just around seeing with the natural eye, hearing with the natural ear. Often Jesus is trying to give them the perspective of heaven, going, you guys are missing everything in front of you. And then the one time the disciple gets it right, where Jesus says to Peter, hey, flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven, the very next thing out of Peter's mouth, Jesus has to say, get behind me, Satan. I mean, it's like you didn't just go from level 10 to level 8. You went from 10 to 0. You didn't even go from, man, you've missed it. You literally were, that's absolutely so far from God, it's demonic. (laughs) I love it because to a large degree, this is what living on earth with our flesh is like. I have have some interesting news for you. I, 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 I have grown up around some of the greatest men and women of God of our generation, of our time, of the last hundred years. And can I tell you something? They're all human. And the interesting thing for me is you just, you just never escape it. You can never get away from it. Of course, this is not to say that we approve of people's lives off the pulpit. Being that, I'm not an example. I understand we have a standard. We actually have accountability. We have a responsibility to the bride and in leadership to live a certain way. I'm not saying that we are excused to not live that way. We must live that way. But I'm not even talking about massive moral failings. I'm saying how they feel, how they can see life, how they can speak, how they can share, how they can sometimes, their senses can make them feel like this is a tough time on earth. And what I, what I find so intriguing is Jesus says something to his disciples, but he actually hinges their ministry on his absence. And, and I find it perplexing because I can imagine them saying, when is it our time? When, Jesus, are we going to pray for the dead and they're going to come to life? When are we going to do greater things than you? And I can imagine them expecting him to say, well, next week I'll be here and I'm going to coach you into this. And he goes, when I'm gone. What do you mean gone? You mean you're going to go? You're going to go for a day? You're going to go rest? You're going to leave me in charge of a sermon and come back an hour later in case I've messed up. No, I'm going to go for a year, for a week. No, I'm going to go for a long time. So much so that you will never see me again until you see me in heaven, right? I'm going to go and that's it for life, folks. I was here. I'm just going to be honest with you. I can even imagine some of the disciples going, did he really come here and live with us? Because I'm just telling you, it was all great, and then he's gone. And now, I don't know what to do. People are trying to kill us. People want to martyr us. This is a night. Did this really happen? And here's the thing about faith, is this is what he's left us. He's left us his Holy Spirit, and he's left us a dependence in a different way on him. But what I would venture to say is that actually, The truth of our faith is that walking and seeing God use us is as reliant on us without us having his presence. In other words, their whole ministry comes about in the moment when you should say it should be over. When they're completely left without Jesus, now he says, now you're going to be used by me. Why this is so interesting to me is that I look at this and I say to myself, It would have been so much easier to defer to him, but that's not what he wants us to do. He doesn't want us to find him. You know, when we were recently in Germany and uh, the people approached me and said, we need you to pray. We would like you to pray a prayer in a prophetic moment over this next generation. 
The first thing that came to my mind is, why on earth do you want me to pray? Pastor Prince is, he's here. Why do you need me? Like, I'm chilled in the crowd, folks. I'm enjoying this. Give him the responsibility because I think, and the interesting thing is we always want to defer that way. But that's not what it is to step into a greater call. What it is to step into God using us. So I want to bring us to an interesting passage of Scripture to just unpack a little bit of this subject today because I really believe the areas of your lack, the areas of your difficulty, the areas of your challenges, and I'm going to unpack a few now, are because they have not been brought to supply. They have not been brought to where you will find resource, to where you will find an answer. So if we look at Luke chapter 22, we know this is an interesting passage of Scripture because it's the build up to Jesus's crucifixion, and now he's getting into very much the end of his time on earth, the end of his, his ministry, and he is trying to set the disciples up to understand what is coming, what's going to take place. And the disciple who I relate so much to, Peter, is having a hard time getting his head around what Jesus is describing. Now, let's give Peter a break this today, all right? Because I'm just going to tell you something. When somebody in this church who's been tithing a million rand a month says God's called him to another city, I don't often jump to the conclusion that God is speaking. <laughs> because it's easier for me that they stay and help us fund the vision God has given us, okay? There is not a person in this church that ties a million rand, and thank you, Jesus, one day we will have someone or more who do that, okay? But here's the thing. It's so much easier to say, what do you want to change this for? It's working for me. Why do you want to die? We are loving you living. This is so much better for me. I, I'm, I, I'm enjoying this. And so in this whole interesting journey where Jesus is trying to get them prepared for the fact that he must go for them, that he must go for us, that he has to walk this out, that he has to go through it. In the natural, they've lived a couple of years with him, seeing him do everything. What do you need? There's supply. What do you need? There's supply. They don't want this to end. And then he's trying to get them to understand that yet on the other side of this crazy moment, on the other side of this inexplicable anguish and suffering and darkness, and never forget, all throughout Christ's crucifixion, up until his resurrection, the disciples don't have a plan. There's no, guys, it's all good. It's going according to the strategy that we have here. It's going according to the game plan that Jesus. Now, in hindsight, we can see God's amazing architecture of the fulfillment of the law to its utmost, of the absolute purchasing of all of us, of our, all of our unrighteousness being cleansed. We can see the amazing architecture of God, but they didn't have hindsight as their guide. They just had circumstance. And let me tell you what circumstance was. The guy above everybody else has just died. He's dead. I lifted up his arm. It's dead. He's not there. He's gone. And now they're going to do the same to us. When he appears to them in his risen form, it says that they are gathered in fear. They're not praying. They, they, aren't, they aren't getting ready for the great commission to go and, and make disciples. They're gathered going, how do we get out of this mess? Not one of them are saying, oh, no, he's coming back. Don't stress. Oh, no, no, don't worry. They're all like, we are losing. There's no hope in this situation. And that's what's so interesting about humanity is I love it because this is us. This is us today. This is the flesh. The flesh often gets itself into situations and we fail to see God is at work. God is in control. And all we can do is freak out and panic. And so as Jesus is preparing them for this, Peter is practical. Peter is pragmatic. And Peter is a go-getter. And you can see him going, you know, John is going on about love. John is going, but let's just call it, we can't, we've got to do something for Jesus. They can't just take him and kill him. They can't just do this to our Lord and Savior. We can't allow this. We've got to, we've got to step up. We've got to have boldness. And so Jesus is describing this. And as he's telling them what he's going to do and where he's going to go and why it's necessary, Peter's not hearing that. He's just hearing, I've got to go. 
And that's freaking him out. Because although God has spoken great things over his life, it was contextual to God being in his life. So God is like, Peter, you're going to build this amazing thing with the church, man. You're going to be a rock. You're going to be so strong. And he's like, that's cool, because I'm weak. But if he's here, I'm strong. I've, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. If Jesus is around, I can walk on water. And if I sink, he picks me up. But what are we going to do if he's not here? Because then you're stuck with me. The clueless fisherman who has no idea what's going on. He's looking at this thing like I would have looked at it. You're going? What do you mean you're going? What do you mean it's necessary that you go so that this can? I don't know what you're talking about. I haven't experienced one move of God without it being through you. It's all been you. Me? Come on. So here's the thing. Jesus says to him in chapter, in 22 verses 31, Simon, Simon, indeed. Right? Because now he's freaking out, Peter. Okay? He says, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. Now, God is saying that Satan is after you and he's even asked for you. Why would Satan be after Peter? Because Satan is no fool. And let me just say this to you. I don't care who tells you this on any screen, on any stage in the world. We do not empower a believer to take on the devil. You don't take him on. Okay? You do not possess an ounce of the strength to take him on. But your Savior already has taken him on, okay? So his defeat has been enforced. So the correct understanding is we don't need to attack Satan, bind Satan, take on Satan, go for it. We don't need to make a big deal of Satan because Satan, in the understanding of who he is, based on what Jesus has done for us, is defeated, all right? They, 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 we don't need to make a big deal. What the battle for now is this understanding of whether you are going to live this life in your strength or in Christ's victory and in his work. Okay, because when you go in your own strength, the devil is strengthened. All right? And so interestingly enough, Jesus says, Satan has asked for you. And why do I say Satan is smart? Because Satan is out to destroy the bride. Satan is out to destroy us. There's a very simple strategy. The devil is never interested in your well-being. Never. There is nothing in your life the devil wants to flourish. Not your health, not your finances, not your relationships. But he never comes to you with his plan. Right? Never. Because that's foolishness. If he comes to you and says, in the end you lose, you go, well, why would I even listen to you? He has to bring his plan and he has to market it to you and he has to persuade you in it. He comes with a voice and he comes with a challenge and he comes with an understanding. But here's the thing. He comes after Peter. Why? Because Peter has been described and declared by Jesus as a central human being to the plan of the birth of the church. And the devil knows he has no chance against the church. The gates of hell will never prevail. In other words, the devil's already heard the declaration of what is going to enforce his defeat. And he's paid attention to who Jesus has said is central to that. And so Jesus is saying, Peter, the devil's got your number. Because he understands what I have spoken over you and what our plans are for you. You have a big part to play in this. Jesus says, but I have prayed for you. In other words, I am also at work. The devil has asked for your number, but I also have your number. As Jesus unpacks what his prayer is for Peter, it is very different to the type of prayer I would have prayed for Peter or for the type of prayer we may have thought Jesus would pray for us. It says here, I have prayed for you that you should not fail. No. It says here, I have prayed for you that... Your faith should not fail. In other words, you are going to fail. In fact, the context of this description is Peter about to get here that he is going to be the greatest failure in documented scriptural history of God. But my prayer is not that you don't fail. 
My prayer is that in your failure, your faith will arise. Now, if faith is dependent on works, it cannot rise in the midst of failure. If failure is dependent on you, it cannot, if, failure can, if faith cannot be dependent on you and rise in a moment of you failing. Right? In fact, the honest truth is it must be absent. So he's not talking about Peter's ability to be in his own strength what God had prophesied over him. He says, my prayer is that your faith will not fail you as you, uh, uh, will not fail you as you are about to fail me. Because when you will come back to your faith, what is it? You return to me. It is absolutely necessary that we highlight, memorize, tattoo this in your brain, on your skin if you need it. What is not returned to Christ is not in faith. And what do we mean by return to Jesus? Because look at the context of this description. You want to be someone used by God, but your mechanism is your strength, your obedience, your effort. All right? I've declared great things over you, but now you've taken that to heart and you think you are going to go and do these things. And the devil understands that I've declared great things over you. That's why he's got your number. So I need to now tell you something. When you fail me, faith is understanding. I haven't abandoned you and I will not fail you. And faith is returning to me from where you are, which is a mess, lost, broken. Every single area in your life today that is in a mess is in your hands, is under your control, is on your shoulders, is something you are trying to figure out, something you are trying to make sense of, something you are trying to put right. In your own strength, you're trying to do this. And Jesus says, that's okay. I've got the patience for it to come to the end of itself. When you come to the end of yourself in one or more areas, you will come to me. And you don't come to me in nobility and in strength because we know that latter on, Jesus pursues Peter. And Jesus says, go call the disciples and Peter. And when Peter comes back to Christ, although he has this great promise over his life, he has zero, nothing, zut to boast about. In fact, he's the greatest failure in history of God. Because he doesn't just let God down. He lets him down in a massive way in a very short period of time in a non-martyring situation. He is denying Christ to a little girl in the end. And not denying Christ as in, yo, I'm not with him, as in, I have nothing to do with him. I, I renounce all of my belief, all of everything, right? In your own strength, you can't stand for God. In your own strength, you can't do anything. In your own strength, the only thing you're good at is failing. Cataclysmically, okay? But God understands that. And Jesus' prayer for us is not one that actually is, isolates us. It's one that embraces us. And it says, if all you possess is faith. Now, what is faith? Because is faith you? I will take your faith, apply your faith. No, faith is I return to the source. I just come back to him. I just find Jesus. Where is Jesus? At the end of yourself. That's where he begins. Uh, I, that's why I boast in my weakness. Now, Paul, didn't you mean your strength? Don't you mean boasting in your obedience? No, 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 no. I have nothing. In fact, if you go and read my account in Romans 7 of me, it's a very, 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 very dark picture of how a human being introspectively finds in of himself absolute bankruptcy of any holiness. Can I just say this to you in some more practical ways? This doesn't just apply to life on earth with God. This applies to life on earth with people. Because here's the problem. We think 
that true relationship is depending on people. We think that the utmost intimate relationship with people is about trusting them, empowering them, believing in them. But here's the problem. What happens when they fail you? See, I find it greatly entertaining that the world wants to take something called marriage that was an idea of God's and try and execute it completely removed from his grace and supernatural supply. Because can I just tell you something? When you marry someone, you get to see that your expectations of them will not be met because you have looked to them in an element of supply. Now, I'm not talking to you about don't be loving, don't be kind, but let's drill down a little bit here. You know, pastor, my husband used to get me flowers every day when we dated. Now he doesn't get me flowers. I'm all for flowers, all right? But just hear the deeper thing. Why do you need flowers? Well, because I need to know I'm loved. Why do you need to know you're loved? Well, because, you know, I'm getting older and he's not, he's at work a lot. And, and when we drill down, okay, I'm just giving a hypothetical here. At the core of the need for flowers is actually a picture of oneself that says, I am not good enough for him. I'm not good enough for others. In other words, I am insecure. I'm attempting to find security within myself. Here's the problem from when I was this. Do you know how many people have told you how awesome you are, but you don't remember it? Do you know that? There are coaches that have believed in you, friends that have said good things about you, parents that told you they loved you, people that have said I loved you. You just didn't believe it. How many of you can remember all the times people have told you horrible things about yourself? Vivid detail, what I smell in the air, what I heard on the radio. <laughs> we are instinctively wired to see ourselves in a negative way. We are instinctively wired, and the devil, this is his greatest ministry, is one of condemnation. Condemnation isn't just, oh, you weren't good for God, it's you're not good. You're not good enough. So at the inherent desire that this lady is describing is Rose's is not actually about his love for her because he could tell her he loves her till she's blue in the face. It's about, I am insecure. And here's the problem. I am looking to you for my security. Here's the greater problem. He's just as insecure as you. He's just as a bumbling all over the place, clueless, watching the sport with, with a burp in one hand on the couch guy as anybody else. And here's the challenge. Marriage is not designed for you to be codependent. You cannot be dependent on them because they are not a supply of, they are not a form of where you would get what you need. Marriage is a dependence on Jesus. All relationship is a dependence on Jesus. Pastor, I don't understand. I get involved in church and people are mean to me. That shouldn't make a difference. But why does it? Because we automatically think that just because this is a church or just because people are Christians, they are now going to change from fleshly human being to spiritual, amazing strength. Here's the issue with that. They're human beings. Jesus does not say return to the leaders of the church. Return to, he says, return to me. And then he says to Peter, strengthen your brethren. So he's speaking prophetically over Peter's life, this pattern of what's about to happen. I'm about to tell you, Peter, you're going to fail me greatly. But I understand that that failure, right, is in need of one thing, a moment of faith. What is faith, Peter? That you have faith in me. That you have faith in my work. In other words, let's, let's, let's be practical here. Peter would have to have a revelation that his sin is paid for because he's just denied Christ three times. If he doesn't have faith that Jesus' blood was shed for him, he can't enter back into the bride. He has, no, he has no grounds to stand, nothing to preach. He must first receive grace before he can even declare it. I mean, I love Peter. When he meets the person at the edge of the temple, he says, hey, silver and gold, I don't have, but what I have, I can give you. I mean, I've spoken about this a few times. What does Peter have? Doctrine? No. In fact, we see in Scripture, Peter getting corrected for his doctrine. Paul's like, what are you preaching, bro? <laughs> Peter was a notorious hater of Gentiles. He thought the Gentiles, let them die, man. Let's get the Jews saved. 
Paul's like, no, Jew and Gentile, bro. If it was up to Peter, it would be the Gentiles, you're on your own. But here's the most amazing thing. Peter knew one thing, grace, because he was a picture of it, because he was the most in need of it, because he was the disciple who Jesus had witnessed failing him and came back to redeem. So he doesn't get up and preach, let me give you 15. No, he just goes, Christ, Christ crucified. That's all I know. That's all I can give you. And the interesting thing is he says to the person at the gates, I can't, I can't give you money. You're a paralytic. I don't know what to give you. I don't have, but I can give you this. I can give you my encounter with God. And when you know God and his grace, supply flows in all other areas of your life. Take my God. Take that grace and walk. So Jesus says, first you're going to fail, but then you'll find faith. In finding faith, what is finding faith? Coming back to me. And then the result is you'll walk out your calling. You'll strengthen your brethren. You'll be a part of birthing the bride. That's my prayer. My prayer is first, fail in your own strength. It's the best thing that can happen to you. And today, there's probably areas in your life that you're like, this is, this is hectic. This is hardcore. You know, some of you are working for people that aren't even um, nice to you, that don't even like you. Some of you are involved in, in, in situations where you go, what do I do? I'm not, I'm not popular. I'm not this. Well, the truth is, if you're looking to people for your identity and your security, you're looking into a form of strength that is not found in Christ. Some people here today are like, you know, oh, man, I'm really concerned about finances. I'm really concerned about my economic future. I'm really concerned about that. Well, it's not your concern. God's very clear what to do with finances, but it comes when you come to the end of yourself. Is it then today that you're struggling is a bad thing, or maybe it is a good thing so that it can be returned to Christ? Look at this. John chapter 13, verses 10 and 11 is a very interesting thing because I love Peter. Peter's always practical. Jesus talks in amazing, in-depth, multiple-layered God wisdom, breath of God stuff. And Peter's just like, what? And what I love about Jesus is sometimes he talks in a manner which I would have just been like, what? But, but I love Peter because Peter's always like, practically, how do you apply this? And let's be honest. Imagine picking up stompies around Jesus, right? Look at this. Jesus said, and for those of you around the world, that means hearing ends of a conversation and totally misunderstanding the concept. So you just, you pick up a part of it and you go in the completely wrong direction. So Jesus says, hey, listen here. He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but he's completely clean. What? He who is bathed is bathed, not hasn't been bathed. He who is bathed needs only to wash his feet, but he's completely clean. And you are clean, but not all of you. And then Peter gets practical and he goes, Jesus, you can't wash my feet. And Jesus says, if I don't wash your feet, I can have nothing to do with you. He says, wash every part of me. <laughs> hey, spirit led. That's not spirit led. That's just flesh, right? Pastor says, hey, it's not bad to get involved in church. I can't right now. But if you get involved in church, there's blessing. How many ears can I serve in? <laughs> you know? it's just, it's just, Peter's just like, let's just try and fix this thing with, I don't know, you know, I'm going to try naturally. And what Jesus is here is he's unpacking something very interesting. He's unpacking what it is to be the new person in Christ. And he says, I've washed you once and for all of all your sin. Okay, that's what it is to be bathed. The Greek word there is fully bathed. It's fully washed. But here's the thing. We're still on this earth. And how many of you know that this earth involves this flesh? Okay. And although we are, our spirit has been saved, and although we are destined for heaven, we still live out, walk out this life in this fleshly body that fights against everything spiritual. That's why I laugh. We're going to get married. Do you understand how the flesh hates marriage? Do you understand how the flesh, I'm going to be a part of the local church. I want to get involved in this. Do you understand how supernatural the local church is and how you need to hear the Holy Spirit for this? Because you are a person submitting to another person. And, and here's the thing. It's easy for people to accept that you're under pastoral leadership, that you're under men and women of God until you realize they're men and women too. Right? But my leader in my team isn't perfect. Great, neither are you. And wait till you get given the opportunity to lead and see how great you are at that. I was talking to our team this week and I was saying to him, do you understand even Jesus had people walk away from his teaching? You know, if someone gets up and walks out when I'm talking this morning and I feel all bad, people walked out on Jesus too. 
people weren't interested in that, it's fine. But, but here's the thing, we want it all to go a certain way. And you have an expectation of me, and you have an expectation of others, and you have an expectation of people that you're in a relationship with that is flawed if it is dependent on us fulfilling a need within you. If we can't fail you, and you can't love us the same, our relationship is not wholly dependent. I'm not talking about, I take all the money home, spend it at Monty. Okay, I'm not talking about, I, I inadvertently steal and carry on. I'm saying this, do not have an unhealthy expectation of others. And what is that? That if they treat you one way or the other, it will, de it will then determine your happiness and your love for them. See, it's supernatural to love someone above their behavior. But that is only an overflow of you first being loved above your behavior. Amen. And when you are walking with God in a manner that is dependent on your works, you will treat others likewise. You will not have grace for others if you have yet to receive grace. In my life, I have no grace for others if I have not sat under the word. So look at this. If you are washed completely, you need only to wash your feet. What are you saying, Jesus? Foot is an interesting thing. Foot goes everywhere on earth. In order for you to get somewhere, your feet need to go there, okay? It, it is part of carrying there. It's part of taking you there. However, feet are connected to the ground. Ground is dirty, especially in the time of Christ, before closed, miracle of closed shoes. Those of you with toes like mine would know. Closed shoes are amazing, okay? My feet are not pretty. Tara would tell you, okay? But here's the thing, they didn't have that, they had open shoes, and, and they would walk everywhere with open shoes. And, and here's the most amazing thing, do you know what the Philistines kept attacking the nation of Israel all throughout the Old Testament and still today? And the root word of Philistine is wallow in the dust. And yet when Jesus comes and, and God, uh, when Jesus, when, when the devil comes in the Garden of Eden, sorry, not Jesus, <laughs> interesting. Um, but when the devil comes and he gets cursed in the end of causing Adam and Eve to fall and God comes in to create the picture for what life on earth would be and he speaks, he says to the devil, you will, you will wallow in the dust, you will crawl in the dust, you will eat the dust. And what's interesting about this is when you look at Goliath and all the Philistines and all of the declarations and all of the challenges and all of the mockeries of the nation of Israel, it wasn't often just mocking the nation of Israel because the nation of Israel did accomplish great things. It was mocking that they were who they said they were in God, that God wasn't on their side, that they weren't that mighty, that they weren't this. It was a language of condemnation. Goliath's language was a language of condemnation. And David, who in his kingly understanding of who he was, says, are we going to let this guy defy our God like this? But yet the root word of Philistine is wallow in the dust, and the devil consumes that which is in the dust. If you would put yourself under condemnation, technically, scripturally, correctly speaking, you are the devil's food. When a pastor preaches condemnation over you, he sets you up for the devil to consume you. Right? Because that's what he can consume, that which is down there. That's not where we... people. Listen, there is nothing wrong with kneeling, but just know this, you don't need to put your head down when Jesus is in the room. Because when Christ walked the earth and people fell down on their knees at his feet, in the essence and the awe of his Godheadness, he always bent down and picked them up. It was, don't you understand? You are a part of this covenant. You are in this. You're not below it or beneath it, right? This God elevates you to be like him as he is, right? It wasn't God the Father. It was God the Son. His ministry is to lift you out of the dust, to pick you up, right? If, if I walked in the room and my children fell on their face every single, it would be, They don't do that. They can actually, they can be on my shoulders. They can go further and see higher at my expense, more than happy, right? And so here's the thing. When we are in the dust, we are going to be at the mercy of a different identity. When we are under condemnation, when we are under what's not good enough, what drives insecurity, what brings about the fallen part of us, the failure Peter was challenged with this. I would challenge you, Peter, Paul. I mean, they were all challenged with the reality that they had to wake up with their flesh and their pasts every day. Convenient for you, Paul, to speak of grace. 
persecutor of the church. Convenient for you, Peter, to preach his salvation and redemption. You weren't even there. You bailed. You failed the great. Uh, and this is what I love. Jesus understands. Peter will fail, but it wasn't over. He says, I get what's about to come. I'm about to tell you how badly you're going to mess up. But understand, this is what's going to happen. You're going to now boast in yourself what you've just done, which is going to result in you failing really badly, which is then going to cause you to go down to the end of your rope. But don't worry, at the end of your rope, you'll find faith, which is watch, my goodness, my finished work, who I say that you are. When you find that, you'll step back into returning to me. I will wash your feet, which is I will wipe the condemnation off, which is what happens when we sit under the word. The word, the word washes us and says, hey, 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 relax. I know you failed, but that's why I paid for it at the cross. I know that you've got challenges. I know that you've got fears, but I've overcome it. Let me just wash your feet. Let me let you know your past is taken care of, your present. Let me speak to you about where you're going, right? Let me minister to you. Jesus does not say, no, I understand. There's a picture in, in the body of Christ where we wash each other's feet, okay? But understand this, okay? You have not got the ability to love each other at all in your own strength. I'm just gonna tell you straight. There is no, there is, humanity doesn't love each other and humanity doesn't care for each other. I don't care what tribe, what language, what creed, what gender you have, what sexual orientation you are, you are inherently self-satisfied and you would put someone down for yourself to rise up any day. You would justify it and find a way to live with it. But here's the thing, we, it's not about us washing each other's feet, it's about us letting Jesus wash ours. And it's the hardest thing because we, we so want to come and return to Christ in nobility. We want to come back to Christ going, I've conquered. We want Peter wants to return to Christ and say, I was there. I stood by your side. I fought off every Roman soldier. And Jesus says, that's not how you return to me. You return to me when, with your tail between your legs and your ears down. Okay, God, I've tried it every do you know what spirit-led is? Have you ever tried to give someone directions that doesn't listen to you? <laughs> I've been on the phone with some people. Now listen, okay? This is how you find our house. And that, yeah, yeah, cool, yeah, okay, yeah. But you know, I haven't heard a word. I hang up, I go, they get lost. Phone back, yeah, yeah, you know, they get lost again. You can hear in their voice when they realize, I don't know where I'm going. Let me concentrate surrender control of the situation to you and follow you every step. Spirit-led is never your way, ever. And that's so hard for us because we live our lives naturally leading our lives, naturally deciding what we will, where we will go, what we'll do, who we'll speak. And so we, we think spirit-led is God, come on the journey with me, right? And so this whole picture is this. Now I wanna tell you what grace is because could you imagine being the disciples who witnessed Jesus prophesying into Peter you are gonna be used to build this bride. You are central, you are key. You're a big part of this, you're a rock, you're strong, right? And imagine being there on Saturday, gathered out of fear, going, oh, this is great, great game plan, right? Jesus, you actually said a big part of the future, a big part of us doing something great, a big part of this amazing birth that the gates of hell will not even prevail again, is central to the butte who bailed on all of us. He's not even here. Can you imagine being a part of a plan that says when I'm gone, he's in charge and he's not there? Just think about that for a moment. They were gathered in fear because in their minds, there was no hope. This is over. I mean, you would have expected the captain, the, the captain says, right, I'm out of here. Here's the vice captain, right? And then it's like, okay, here's your chance. And at his chance, he's not even, he, I, I can't play. I can't play these people. That's too good a team to play. I'm out of here. So the plan was the guy who's not even here. That's not a plan at all. That's why they thought this is over. That's why. This is finished. But do you want to know Jesus had already foreseen this? And this is why grace is such an amazing thing because you see grace at work in this situation because even though Peter doesn't deserve, God has still destined him for it. 
So he comes to the end of himself and God finds him and Jesus calls for, the angel calls for him by name and, and he gets called back. Jesus is calling for, for the disciples and he wants them to meet him. And yo, yo, but I'm not, no, no, he asked for you by name. And watch this. Peter's journey was central to him coming to the end of himself before God could say, now I can use you. I'm not talking about God makes you suffer. No, but you go your own way and then you suffer. But when you come to the end of yourself, you finally have no other choice but to leave it in his hands. And when it's in his hands, he says, cool. Even if time appears like it's been lost, even though it feels like the game is against us, we're still got this, I've still got this under control. Because we know that later on, Peter's greatly used. But here's Peter's commissioning. Jesus says to Peter, do you love me? And he goes, yeah. And he goes, no, Peter, do you love me? And Peter says, you know. And Jesus says, do you love me? And Peter's response is interesting the third time. Now, why this is such a significant thing is we, we often overlook it. What is the first commandment? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul. The type of love there is with every part of you, right? It's, it's the most sacrificial love. Jesus says, do you love me like that? Right? What should have the answer been? I would have gone, yeah, I desire to. So he's like, okay, this is a holy commandment, the first commandment. But Peter understands something. I can't really say that because I bail all the time. I mean, he hasn't done anything great yet. Jesus says, but I know that, the truth about you. So let's, let's investigate this for a moment. Do you love me like that first commandment? Uh, maybe. Peter, let me ask you again. Do you love me like that first commandment? Uh, God, you, 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 you know. In other words, I'm deferring to you here because I don't want to give you the honest answer. Third time, right? Do you love me like that? Peter says what? I only like you. That's what the Greek says. He doesn't use the same love like Peter, like Jesus used. He says, I only kind of like you. Right? And what is Jesus' response? Awesome. Now we can deal with who you really are in your own strength. Go feed my sheep. And he commissions him in too. You're the senior pastor. Go for it, boy. You're ready. Because you realize in your own strength, you don't even have love for me. You kind of like me. But it's not about that love. It's about what I am for you. Three times he denies Christ. Three times Jesus says, do you love me? His redemption was in him first admitting, I can't, but you can. That was the redemption moment. The redemption moment wasn't, of course I love you. With everything. You came to find me. You came to redeem me. You gave me a second chance. Of course I love you, Jesus. It's God he's talking to and God knows all things. Jesus is like, let's get honest for a moment here, Peter. Can you boast in your love for me? And at the end of the conversation, three times, Peter comes on the third time with what we would think would bring about his rejection, which is what we think would bring about Jesus saying, oh, you're not ready. You're not ready to lead, Peter. I thought you would need to love me like that. And Jesus says, hey, 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 third time, do you love me with everything? No, I only like you. Awesome! Now you're ready. Because you have nothing to boast of in your own strength. What in your life today is a frustration? What in your life today is really getting you down? What in your life today is, 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 is really coming against you? Who's bearing the burden for that situation? Because I can tell you this. Whatever comes to the end of itself in and of yourself and is brought to Christ finds the solution, finds a peace that surpasses every understanding. If you're stressed today, it's because there's something in your life you're carrying and God doesn't want you carrying it. And what I love about our Lord and Savior is He's actually explaining to us life on this earth is dependent in a life of fullness on constantly returning to Him. How? How do we return? Noble? See, Paul says, hey, hey, I boldly come to the throne of grace, right? In a time of 
need, right? When I need to obtain, when I don't have, when I go, I don't know. I, I, I sometimes find that, the, that actually the most holy life is the life that wakes up going, don't know, but he does. Don't have the answers, but he does. We, one of these days we'll start to unpack relationships and marriage because I feel like a lot of us in relationships create an unhealthy dependency on a spouse that they could never fulfill. And in that disappointment, we think they are the issue or our relationship is the issue, but actually we have placed expectation in the wrong place. A Jesus-centered marriage is not two people who are amazing at being Christians. A Jesus-centered marriage is two people who put all their hope and trust in Jesus. Pastor Prince says this, I don't trust my husband, I trust Jesus with my husband. I don't trust my wife, I trust Jesus with my wife. Very different. Because one says, if you fail, we're doomed. The other says, if you fail, just return to him. How many of us, if we operated in a grace like this in our marriage, would then have the freedom to be more bold, to be more brave, to be more declarative? But sometimes, listen, as a husband, when a wife says, come on, you're like, oh my goodness, I've got to work this all out. I've got to, I've got to do this. I've got to do that. I've got to, and the same thing. It's like, let me tell you something. Everything in this book, I said this in the earlier service. Here is the lie the devil wants you to believe. You can achieve this book. You can't achieve one word. Not one word. In fact, all you can do is break every word. All you can do is do the opposite of this. The only way you see yourself fulfilling this is to come to the end of yourself and letting God do it through you. But here's the thing. Jesus doesn't say to Peter, right? You're going to return to me. Get yourself in order. Prove to me that you're worthy. Go through this whole process. No, he says, the second you return to me, you step into my supply. It's an unconditional, undeserving favor that says if all you will do is put it in my hands, I'll take care of it. This is what it is to know a finished work. And this is what it is to walk with Jesus. I love it. I just wish more pastors said, hey, I don't pray nearly enough. Hey, I don't have faith nearly enough. Hey, how many pastors out there today? I pray more than everyone. I pray more than this. Peter says, I only like you, God. Cool, go feed my sheep. Come to the end of yourself, man. And tell people, I'm just a guy depending on Jesus. I'm just a guy depending on Jesus. That's all I am. I'm just a woman depending on Jesus. How have you done this great thing? I haven't done a thing. If you hung out with me, you would know it is not me. But I have learned who to depend on. I have learned where my strength comes from. I have learned what it is that I don't live, but Christ lives in me. That he gets all the glory today. Amen.